So welcome to this first meeting of our oral history workshop in this new academic year. My name is Irene Auerben-David and I'm the director of the LBI Jerusalem and will chair today's lecture of Albert Lichtblau. But before I'm beginning, I would like to announce that we would like um, to record this meeting and make it available afterwards on our YouTube channel. So those of you who would rather not want to, be, to appear there, please turn your cameras off now. That would be good. Um, we are now starting already the third year of this forum that was created as interdisciplinary meeting point in which different projects are presented that are based on interviews. And it also serves to discuss different aspects of methodology of our history. And I would like to thank very much our cooperation partners, Sharon, Dr. Sharon Libney, who is the head of the oral history division at the Hebrew University here in Jerusalem, and Dr. Margalit Bejarano, the head of the Israeli Oral History Association, who sends you her excuse for being absent, unfortunately, today. Before Corona, we would meet in the reading room of the LBI in Jerusalem, and now on Zoom, we used the new digital possibilities and invited scholars also from abroad, outside of Israel, to participate. And I'm very glad that Albert Lichtblau, Professor Emeritus of History from the University of Salzburg, accepted our invitation to be with us here today. Lichtblau was chair and vice chair of the Center for Jewish Cultural History in Salzburg. His areas of research include contemporary history, Holocaust, genocide, and migration studies, but also oral history and audiovisual history. Currently, he's working on various projects like the Austrian exhibition in Auschwitz-Birkenau, in the State Museum in Auschwitz-Birkenau, and on a monograph on the Austrian Heritage Collection, which is still quite at the beginning. And he will present part of this today. Um, an interview collection, the Austrian Heritage Collection is an interview collection that he initiated in the 1990s. It was his idea and together with many other people, and he will speak about it, this could be realized. And um, first in New York and young Austri um, Austrians um, from the association Gedenkdienst um, came to volunteer abroad as part of their alternative service and made interviews mit with Jews that left Austria following the Anschluss in the 19 1938 and immigrated to the United States. This project has also an Israeli part B from 2012 to 14 and from 2018 onwards, some 130 interviews have been made here in Israel by the Lubeck Institute Jerusalem. Both parts of this collection, the American and the Israeli are online accessible through the website of the LBI New York. The audio files of the interviews can be heard and our, our colleagues at the Simon Wiesenthal Institute for Holocaust Studies um, in Vienna prepared another um, platform and uh, Albert will show it in his lecture where selected interviews are accessible and, um, and they established a platform which offers diverse ways of accessing and working with these interviews. Um, <clears throat> since the project has been launched in Israel so much later than in the United States, the interviewees have been considerably older than back in the 1990s in the States and are testifying about a different time of their life. But since the focus of the interviews does not explicitly lay on the events in the 1930s, but it's also asking about the flight and the new home, actually about the entire life, we're asking for a life story outside of Austral Austria, the interviews actually differ very much. Albert Lichtblau will speak about a community-oriented memory project on exile, the Austrian Heritage Collection. Um, just technically, he will speak about 45 minutes. I would like to collect your questions and comments. Please simply write them in the chat and I will um, convey them to, um, to Albert after his lecture. And then we plan to close this meeting around seven, seven and some minutes, something like this. Albert, please. Okay, thank you very much, Irene. Um, I'm glad to be at least online in touch with you. Um, but I'm sorry to be in Austria, Salzburg. I really would love to travel. Okay, I have a PowerPoint for you and I will try to show it. Okay. 
Okay. And I think I can, what can I do here? Okay. I try to do something else. I think it's better I try something. Okay. So now it should work out. So that you can see me at least. <laughs> so that I don't speak in the dark. Okay, I'm talking about the project uh, which you already mentioned already, which we started in the 1990s in, in New York. And okay, let's, and thanks by the way for the nice invitation, which I really like. So what I will do is to talk a little bit about the project genesis and also parallel projects. So to make clear that this is one of many projects about the concept of the project, the implementation um, about collected and generated sources about my own project now and other activities, which one should mention as well. Uh, by the way, if you cannot hear me properly, please interrupt me because I'm alone here and I hope it works out well. Okay, about the project Genesis. Um, I was working in New York in the early 1990s for a project at the Lübeck Institute. You know, they had a big, uh, collection of memoirs, unpublished memoirs. And there was a wonderful project about Germany, but they didn't have a project on Austria. So they asked me if I would be willing to publish the Austrian memoirs. And that was one of the reasons why I went to New York. Um, what I really loved about this project is that I was working the whole day long at the Leo Beck Institute reading lots of memoirs, making copies and so on. And after the work, I usually I met somebody of the Austrian uh, community there, the survivor community, and took my tape recorder and taped several interviews. And it was really like a snowball system because at the end I had so many contacts, I couldn't, I couldn't manage it. Um, so what came out, uh, we, we started a film, I did a film project with a colleague of me, and this is the book about the memoir collection. So, but what I found out that the visits, I'm sure you all know this, if you, if you visit a person, a survivor, you always visit a, a private archive. And it's not only the stories, it's also what, you know, what you can find in the rooms, uh, what you can see. And I was just fascinated, but also depressed more or less because the Leo Beck Institute in New York was more or less a very German uh, oriented archive. And, you know, Austrians and Germans not often get along too well. Um, and so this was a separate world more or less, um, but there was nothing for Austria there. So what I was thinking of, of was to to engage the Lierbeck Institute also for the Austrians. So I went home more or less depressed, <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, we did the interviews and I just to, to, I want to make sure that you are aware that there are other collections as well. And what I'm pretty proud of one project and this is the project of the interviews we did, me and many colleagues, and we all had them in you know, our private archives and we had to do something to make sure that they are accessible. So I worked together with the Austrian Media Tech. So this is an audio archive, the only professional, and they were willing to take over our, our interviews. So this is a different project, the more than 600 interviews in this collection, which is mentioned here. Uh, and they got um, by the UNESCO Memory of the World on a ship, which I think this is very nice. And by the way, I didn't know that the collection is called after me because I started it. But nevertheless, it's, it's, it's good that we have all this. Aside from, from interviews, we also publish books. And this, I give you an example, these are books based on on interviews, all, all these books. And this is Annie Robert. She lived in Tel Aviv in the retirement home of the Austrians. And she wrote a lot about what she experienced. So, but 
all the other projects for interviews usually it took me 40 hours to interview a person and to make a transcript and to edit it and to publish it. Um, so now about the project genesis, I told you I went home, I was depressed, more or less, what can we do? Um, I was a, at the early stage of my career, so I didn't have a professorship, I didn't have an infrastructure. I approached several people and asked, uh, asked them about ideas. The first idea was to send historians from Austria to, to New York, but it would have been only one year. So by coincidence in these years, in the early 1990s, they started the Gedenkdienst and Irene mentioned it already. So this is the alternative service uh, to military and they sent people to memorials and, and, and museums. And I asked them if they wouldn't be willing to send someone to the Lübeck Institute. I also asked the Lübeck Institute if they are ready to take one of the young people there and to make sure that they have to do their own work because usually you go there and you have to do paperwork, you know, and this is something very different. They are very active. Um, so this is, was the first very, very important uh, step to, to create the infrastructure by the Lübeck Institute, by the Gedenkdienst. And there was another coincidence, the National Fund of the Republic of Austria for Victims of National Socialism, uh, Socialism was established in 1994 and you could apply there. So they had all the contacts which we needed. So we were also uh, very successful to, to bring them in. And so the, the project design was, we could start. Um, we asked lots of people, so, okay, I initiated the project, but you cannot do this on your own, especially if you don't have an infrastructure. So we needed the Lübeck Institute arch archivists, we needed the Gedenkdienst, and I asked several Austrian and American historians and experts like anthropologists and back psychotherapists, Dorothy Whiteman, historian Deborah Deshmoor, and we discussed the project design in many, many meetings. Uh, so what came out was that we had a, the idea that the National Fund, you know, this is the fund for, we call it uh, gesture payment, um, sent out an initial letter asking for basic data to those who applied for, for this payment. So this was just the right moment to start with this project. And at the Liu Beck Institute, the two Gedenkdiener, one or two Gedenkdiener were sitting and waiting for the for for letters coming in, and had to, you know, if somebody responded positively, they could get in touch if the person was willing to get in, that you can um, contact her. They got in touch with the person, so this is how it more or less started, and this is the project design. So in case of a positive response, so there was initial letter, people sent uh, the letter to the Liu Beck Institute. And in case of this positive response, they were asked if they're willing to, to fill out a second, much more extensive question. It's, it's a questionnaire, 10 or uh, 12 pages. And they also were asked about personal top documents for the archive, for the collection, and also we were asked if they're willing to, to give an interview, but we were concerned because there were many parallel projects like uh, the Shoah Foundation interviews um, project also started in the mid 1990s. So our intention was, and this was uh, a little bit difficult to translate it to, to the States because this is a very Austrian thing, is that we wanted to create lasting social interactions between young uh, between survivors and young Austrians. So it's not only, it's also, you know, uh, when uh, whoever does interviews knows this, it's not only a, a receiving element, but it's also a giving. So it's a receiving and giving uh, element. And if it's in the balance, then it's, it works out very good. Uh, but it also was a message to the survivor community uh, we wanted to show that there's a serious interest in Austria to learn about their lives. And also that we take over a kind of responsibility to save the life stories for future generations. So this is something I think which is very important also for survivors to, 
to make sure that their stories and the stories of their families don't get lost. And I know this is one of many projects, but I think this was important. We had a wonderful support group of survivors. Uh, this is a photo of an uh, exhibition. I will um, refer to it later in 2002. And here, this was a meeting point for those who did the civil service in New York at the Gedenkdienst. Uh, these are the young people, one, two, three, here's another one, and here's another one, and survivors. It's called Oskar Maria Grafstammtisch. I don't know if you know the author. He was Bavarian. He was very strange. He was a... Uh, he, he loved to drink beer. He had his uh, leather trousers in New York uh, and he had his so-called Stammtisch, so a meeting at, an, at a restaurant and they discussed, you know, whatever there was to discuss. And it just was a, and it still is a wonderful uh, environment for, for everybody who came here uh, for the Lübeck Institute working. And it also started with her, Gavi Glückselig, because when I was working at the the Beck Institute on the memo, she was sitting next to me and she was working on, on photos, you know, for the archive. And <laughs> since then I'm very careful about what is written on photos because, you know, I saw how you make a decision to, <laughs> to categorize a photo and then to, to give the information on it. But she was wonderful and she asked me to join her. And this is what I did and I lived nearby and every week I went to the so-called Stammtisch and there are many friends and we will meet Trude later also again. Okay, so this project is going on since the mid-1990s. The young people usually uh, stayed there for 12 or 14 months. There were changes. There, were, there was always was an overlapping term so that one generation learned uh, from the other. Um, the National Fund wrote letters, approached the oldest age groups. So we were, I mean, this we started in the mid 1990s, so we could reach out even for people who almost were 100 years old. Then, so you know, were born in the late 19th century or early 20th century. So the first focus was in New York because it was also about personal context. Then they reached out to New York states and the other states like New Jersey or even Canada. I think it is a real success story uh, because it, I, it's the most important exile archive for I call it non-famous survivors from Austria in the US. And as Irene mentioned, I thought Jerusalem started in 2013, but Irene said 2012, okay. So never believe what you can find in the internet. <laughs> so to give an example how these young people looked like. Um, so they had a very small office, no window, were sitting on the computer and you know, did their, did their daily work. And so those who had to smoke had to go on the street um, and they were very active. So they were calling all the time, having in, being in touch, reaching out um, and meeting people to interview them. So this is, these are the results from last year. So the initial, uh, there were more than 3,700 3, responses, which we never expected. I don't know. Um, this is a very high number. And the second questionnaire, which I said is much more extensive, we got responses of 1,800 uh, witnesses. Then we have seven, more than 700 interviews. And we have more than approximately 480 collections. And within the collections, you can find 100 memoirs. So the memoirs relate to interviews, also life stories and to the questionnaire. So this is the website. By the way, the Gedenktina not only are men, so um, the, to the alternative service. These were the last Gedenktina. Last year they had to leave New York because of the lockdown. And this is the former Chancellor Bierlein who visited the Lübeck Institute uh, last year. And this is the chief archivist, by the way. Okay, so uh, I would like to talk a little bit about my own project. Um, I called it 
Lichtblau Project to make clear this is something which I'm working on now. Uh, what I have, what I, with what I will start uh, the questionnaires. So we still have to fill in, you know, so the to many answers to, to make, make them data, uh, to make them readable for the computer software. So, but this is the main source at the beginning. So imagine you have one question and you have 1,500 responses written responses. So this allows you a generalization. The difficult thing is that you have to categorize answers. And this is kind of tricky. Um, to give you an example, what I really learned from this project is how long it sometimes took that people, you know, uh, were on the migration ways. Uh, to give an example, this was a question in the first at the initial um, letter. This was a one page questionnaire and we asked about the route of immigration. And this for instance is Edith, born in 1902. Uh, she went from Yugoslavia, England, Palestine to the USA. Um, so this is an example of a friend of me. So this is how the letter the page looks at all and we, there's, there you can see we have several questions but this is the important one uh, what was the route of emigration and this was very you know here you can see that he started out in October 1938 uh, moved to Switzerland then France and he was a member of the of, he was a youngster and his family was social democratic oriented so this was a group in France stayed together in Ancy uh, later on in Montauban, and most of them luckily could escape. And here he writes, he escaped over Marseille to Zabel. This is the last uh, village in France. Uh, they went illegally to, to Spain. And this is the place where Walter Benjamin committed suicide at, at the Spanish side, and over Barcelona to Lisbon. And he started out in October 1938. And in December 1940, he arrived in, in the US. So it was more than two, more than a two years away. So what we can find out to, to, to give an example of a, an easy generalization, you can ask how long did it take for you to come to the United States? So uh, this is the number of those who, who made it within the first year this 290 is the number of those who made it until the end of World War II. And these are the numbers 226 and 32 of those who migrated to the States later on. By the way, many from, from Great Britain and many from Palestine, Israel. Later on, you can ask, why did you do this? So but this is not, this is just to give an example how long migrations lasted for, for some people. So the question at two was really this, it was aiming on that the people um, answer in their own words. So it was a kind of writing animation. So there were sets of questions, seven, uh, about the time before the Nazis took over in March 1938 in Austria. And there was a set of questions about the experiences in the Nazi time. And there were 11 questions about life in the United States. Uh, yeah. To give you an example how a question looked like, you always have a header, more or less. Please tell us about your friends and acquaintances. So this is not a question, <laughs> it's just, please do this. And usually we had, um, between brackets, we had some more questions. Um, in this case, we asked, were your friends mostly Jewish or non-Jewish? Did you have any close non-Jewish friends? And in this case, it's the same person, Kurti, whom I mentioned before, the social democrat kid. More, more of my friends were Jewish, but also had some non-Jewish friends from school or building. So there was a reason why we included these uh, sub questions because there was a project also in Israel um, for of, of 
about Israeli citizens of Austrian um, who came from Austria to, to Palestine or Israel. And we used kind of questions they also used for Palestine and Israel so that we can compare a little bit. Uh, to give another example, and this is one of my favorite questions, and this is part of the number three when it when we ask about the life after um, after the end of the Second World War. So the question was, have you ever visited Austria since the war? If so, how often? Uh, so I would say then it's kind of a mistake. We, we asked too much. What did you do there? Can you recall some of your impressions during these visi visits? Have you ever thought of going back permanently? So, uh, what really worked out very well is the question, how often? I will give you the numbers later. Um, in this case, again, uh, Kurti responded, and this is interesting, when was the first you know, return travel to Austria? How long did it take that it was possible for you to go back? So it, for him, it was 1985. Um, and then a number of times since then, he visited cousins and the families and traveled with them once on, on in Vienna. He had an invitation to Vienna and he spoke on a conference in community security and youth services. He was a social worker. Uh, it goes on, the first time was accelerated with visiting uh, some places he knew before, like school. So this is something you know, the first travel back was all, all, always very exciting. I give you another example. So remember the questions we asked before, Friedrich Kahr, born 1919. I visited Vienna 1982 to see my father's grave in the Zentralfriedhof, the main uh, graveyard in Vienna, and to set the plaque for my mother who was umgekommen in Auschwitz, was murdered in Auschwitz. And this is something uh, important for those who only came to Austria a few times, they had a reason to go there to visit the, the graves of the family was one of the main reasons, or you had an invitation. I found the Viennese just as phony as they always are. Um, I think this is an interesting, you know, response because uh, there's a time change within the sentence, so the Viennese still are phony. To your question, if I ever thought of going back permanently, I can only answer, and this is one of my favorite answers. You must be kidding. Okay. Um, so that you can see, you know, a little bit to, to get an idea how the responses were, did you, the travels to Austria, this, I put those who came back only one to three times together, so the number is more than 50%, approximately one third traveled to Austria pretty often, like, like 10 times or more. And this number is also important, never went back. This is 10%. But I would be careful about these numbers because I think this group who never went back also didn't respond to the project, more or less. So I guess that the number would be higher. But we don't know because we didn't get in touch with them. But you only if you have numbers, if you generalize, you always have to think about you know how, um, what the numbers could mean and if you could, could read them in different ways. Okay, so I have the questionnaires which is a lot of work, a lot, a lot of information. But for a deeper understanding, I want to also include the interview transcripts of the, of the foundation of the Austrian Heritage Collection. And this is interesting because the interviews have these young Austrians as addresses. And then I mentioned this at the beginning, you also have the memoirs. And in the memoirs, you have different addresses because usually they are written for for family purposes, usually they're written for the fam for the children or grandchildren or great grandchildren. So you have a, you have very different settings, and what I will try is to compare this these various informations, and what was important, you know, um, at the questionnaire, at the interview, and at the memoir. 
Is it similar? Is it different? Okay, uh, there's a lot of information hiding in the Lyubeck Institute in New York, and this is what archives are for. Um, and there's a lot of work to do for future generations of historians as well, which is pretty fine. So I took Leo Glückselig because I mentioned I published a book about him and he has really a huge collection. He was very talkative and people like to talk with him. So he, his interview, these are 13 tapes, which and I think one can see it some, uh, these are more than 12 hour interviews. Um, and he was interviewed in 2003. But aside from this, you have archival material, you have drawings. Um, you have in the collection, you have manuscripts, you have correspondence, you have an oral history. And you don't only have this, I only, as he was a friend, I only have my own Leo Glixili collection at home. And this is one of, of his photos. He, was, he also did photos for advertisements. So this all I can use. Okay. Um, to give an, another example about something I really think of very often about is this: the question about did you or your family ever experience any, any anti-Semitism before March 1938? So when the Nazis took over, if so, please give details and these are the numbers and by the way we can compare it to the project in Israel that the numbers of experienced anti-semitism are higher than in this project so what I found interesting that 45 percent responded that they didn't have personal that they didn't encounter any anti-semitism before the Nazis took over only little and there's an, an category I just called it anti-Semitic experiences, but I also took um, a special category with anti-Semitic violence, which usually meant that it, most of the time it happened at schools where you know, other pupils were spitting or throwing stones. So it was, it was bodily violent, not only a violent language. So to give you an example, what I meant before about, you know, using a questionnaire and using the interview transcripts, I show you an example which I like very much is about Charlotte B. She was born in 1904 in Vienna. By the way, she was musician and also a member of the Palestine Orchestra in the late 1930s um, and moved to New York later on. So in the question about anti-Semitism, the answer at question at two is not at all. But there's also an interview with her. And the interview asked her, did you experience Vienna as anti-Semitic? And she said, no, but Vienna was very anti-Semitic. You could hear the word Saudi Jewish pig almost daily. So it's the same person giving a different answer. And I think this is what I want to show. Uh, what you can do if you compare different sources to understand that a no or not at all doesn't mean a no, not at all. <laughs> and this is what really fascinating. So what I have to do is to really do, do a close reading of the written texts. And this is different to the transcribed spoken word. So what I, what's really challenging is to, to find categories, you know, for each uh, response, for each question, uh, to make it possible to generalize uh, the responses. Uh, nevertheless, I will try to read between the lines, as I mentioned before, like the time change within a, within a sentence, or for instance, what is well known if you use the word I or we. So how do you refer to your, your own story? And I have to analyze the memos and the transcript in a separate step. And if I use transcripts, uh, if I really want to use a quotation, I will go back to the original source, to the, to the interview and listen to, you know, um, how it was phrased and, and, and if this maybe has another information as well. Uh, okay, these are my sources. I only can manage it with a software tool. Maybe you know this, I use Max Kudia. 
which works out pretty well for sources like this and makes it possible um, to look for phrases or, or words. I mean, if you have an ebook, you know this from, from that side, how it works. Okay. Uh, I just want to give an example of that, you know, that topics emerge, you know, just by reading and listening. And this is more about the interview part. What I really like and think it's fascinating is about the language switching. So for instance, if you do interviews with male survivors who joined the American army, uh, you can find, often can find out uh, that they started out to give the interview in German and as soon as they joined the army, they, they switch into English because they don't have the German terminology, for instance, again. And this is, you know, um, a step when they really got into the American identity world. So I took part to Kominik because I knew him. He was a tough guy, tough cookie. In Vienna, he was a member of the Beta, moved to Palestine, uh, joined the British army, was fighting for Israel. And one day he found out that he's a pacifist and moved to the United States. This is what he said in the interviews. So this is a classical beginning of Christian. And he said, this is tape number one of the Austrian Heritage Collection interview with Walter Kominik conducted by Christian Klosch at yeah, February 1997. And the response was very good, very good. Let's keep going. <laughs> so, you know, when we start the interviews, we always have to make clear that everybody knows that it's on the source, who we are, when we are, where. And so it goes on, could you please tell me your name at birth, when and where you are born? My name at birth, so Walter responded, is the same as it is now. And this is, Christian asked. I did. When I got married, we don't, the men don't change the name. The woman changed the name. It's very schwer to, to listen what, what you are really interested. And then it goes on. And this is a continuous changing of, of, of language within one sentence. Um, yeah, it's just an example to, that you get aware that, you know, there are many aspects which I didn't think of before also you know emerge when you when you analyze interviews. Um, more or less at the end or coming soon to the end. I really want uh, to bring in and Irene also mentioned it before that there's a group in Vienna who's very active. I don't know if Philip is here already. Uh, Philipp Rohrbach, and they started, it's called Austrian Heritage Archive. And this is how it looks like. It's a very nice website. You can approach it. It's also English and German. And here you can see, you can approach different interviews like this. There's a two sides, two pages of proposals and we will meet Trude Jeremias. We saw her already at the Stammtisch in Vienna, in New York. And yeah, if you go deep, oh, sorry, wrong direction, you can see what, what is offered about Trude. Uh, you can listen to the, to the interview. You can, you have a transcript here. You have additional material. And this is about what she's talking about. And this is just a wonderful source, which makes it it makes the interviews accessible now on the website and it's very well done uh, and i think it's it's very good for if you want to work with the with these interviews um, there was an exhibition in 2002 so remember the whole project started in mid 1990s and after a few years, the, these young people of the Gedenktins wanted to do something to show what's going on in New York with the project. And they were able to have an exhibition, a cooperation between the Leo Beck Institute in New York and the Vienna Jewish Museum. So there were exhibitions in New York and Vienna. And I think this was a, this was a wonderful bridge of, of the two sides of the project and then the wonderful connection. And as you also can see, we were taping with uh, 
cassettes during these years. And this is how cassettes looked like then. And uh, this is Peter Bush. And just to give you an example, he was a photographer and also he made photos for the Playboy, for instance. And if I show you the photo, I think you know what I meant. You can see what I meant at the beginning. If you see such a apartment, you, see, you know you're in a private museum more or less. It's full of memorabilia, of documents. It's full of private history. And it was just wonderful that you can approach persons like Peter Pasch and to ask him about his life and maybe that he could share one or the other photo for the, for the archive and talk about the background of what you can see. Okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, so the, this project was somehow just, just wonderful because these young Austrians uh, had the idea also to, to, you know, they had to choose one of the survivors, their favorite survivor. And this is the booklet, right, was edited for the, for the, for the exhibition. And you have various, you know, survivors who were chosen by one or the other Gedenktina. And there were also the, interviews with those who, those young people who, who were in New York, the Gedenktins and reflecting their own work. And I also interviewed uh, for this project, one of the curators, Christian Prasser. He was an architect and he was uh, one of the earliest um, Gedenktina at the, at the New York project. He was, and is still is, a very, very smart guy. And what I, found very promising about the project that he told me said that as an architect he really learned for his life in, during this project because what you do when you interview people you have to learn to listen but you also have to learn to ask questions and this is something he really can use for his work as architect now in, in, in various ways so the idea was that Christian and um, his colleague Arno Giesinger, a photographer who now lives in Paris, um, visited all, this, all those survivors who were presented at the exhibition. And Christian Brasser, as an architect, had his favorite uh, survivor, Max Breinin, because he was an architect as well. And he interviewed him for the project. So at the end, um, I wanted to visit Max, and, but Max didn't respond. Uh, and Christian didn't know what's going on. So he got in touch with the family of Max Brennin and they told him that Max Brennin passed away a few days ago. So uh, in this interaction, the, I, don't, I don't remember who, with whom it was, Christian spoke, the person said, it's such a pity because Max Brennin never told them about his life, about his you know, life experience. And Christian asked the person if it would be possible that they keep everything as it looks like and they make a photo of the apartment, how it looks like uh, when, you know, when Max Brennin passed away. And this is the photo of the apartment. Again, like with Peter Bash, you can see it's full of memorabilia. And Christian told me in the interview with him that it was just, you know, he's, he suddenly was the expert of the family or the life story of Max Brennin and was able to, to tell them lots of details because after the interview, Max Brennin did a lot of drawings about his life and Christian could refer to this and to tell them, tell this to the family. And I think this is, well, something we are very important. Okay, um, I almost come to the end um, of, my, of my talk. Um, what's important is for me that, you know, there's a big challenge you have a mass source 
which makes it able to, to categorize and generalize. But nevertheless, we have, we always have uh, individual life stories. And to find a balance of between generalization and to be aware that there are different voices and that every voice is unique and extraordinary. I think that's the big challenge. And I hope I could show you this a little bit with the example of, um, of the anti-Semitism quotation where you can look at, you know, what a person says to one answer and how she responds. Yeah, and for me, it's just a wonderful project and I'm very thankful to everybody of the Gedenkdienst and of the Lear Beck Institute who collaborated for these projects. And I think that's, for me, I was a little bit faster as I expected. So it's a little bit more than 40 minutes, but I think that's okay. I'm more or less at the end and go come back to you. And yes. Thank you very much. Um, there are some comments and questions from Nuri, yeah. um, which is exciting that uh, Leo Luxelik was her mother's cousin. So we have someone okay. of the family. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Nuri also wanted to know what's your definition of a survivor? Mm -hmm. And uh, if there are also interview projects with uh, interviews involved with the second generation. Um, well, I don't know. I mean, the, the question, who is a survivor? I don't know what it refers to because we use the, the, we use the term more or less for everybody who could, was able to escape from Nazi Austria. But, you know, there's a, it's a difference if you could escape or if you survived, uh, you know, if you were interned, if you were imprisoned um, and survived the Nazi time in, in Nazi Germany. Because everybody was in danger. Irene, I think that we can also ask personally and not only in the chat now, because maybe people would like to say something. Um, may I, ask, I respond to the second question? So there's no, not in this case, uh, a second generation project so far. I mean, the Gedenktins was thinking about this very often and I would think this would be the next step more or less. But as far as I know, it, it, it didn't start right now. And I don't know if, if this project will go into that direction. Um, so Miri is asking if there is or was a public response to these projects. Um, well, at least uh, the exhibition, sure, this was important. Uh, the public response also refers to the arc, to the project I showed before of the Osprey Group. Um, I think, you know, for me it was. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. For me, it was most important to to save the material first, to 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 generate an archive. So, um, as I mentioned, I did a lot of interviews in the early 1990s, and if I would have the plan to you know to analyze each interview, I couldn't make the interviews. So for me, it was more important to do the interviews than to analyze them at the first stage because otherwise, we didn't we couldn't make so many interviews. But maybe I, I can just add from the presentation, maybe Philip can say something in, that was in 2018 in Vienna, when the website was presented, it was 18, there was quite a um, public response to that, right? Philip, you want to say a word about it? Yeah. Um, there was a broad public response in the newspapers and also um, uh, many users contacted us. And what was very interesting for us that actually relatives of um, the people who got interviewed and whose um, interviews on the webpage got in touch with us. So that was um, 
quite um, surprising. But, um, you know, as uh, we are not the only project that went online with, with, with interviews. There is another project in Austria called Weiter Erzählen that makes also a broader set of um, oral history um, interviews accessible. And I think um, that you always get a certain kind of attention when it's connected somehow to newspaper articles or to presentations or something like this. And then this attention peak goes um, down again, but we are constantly working on making more and more material available. And um, it, it's also like on this online level, a pretty new project. I mean, we went online, I think in 2017. So we'll see how it will progress. But um, it's also a matter of finances because um, it's very, it's very um, expensive to transcribe the interviews. It's very um, work intensive and expensive to make them accessible and in, in a way so that the broader audience can, can work with them. And um, whenever we have the money and whenever we are able to do so, we get a lot of attention, but it's just like limited to a certain period. And then we have to regenerate the attention, I would say. And um, that's the first thing. And the second thing just um, about this second generation interview project. Um, I think like I was also a Gedenkdiener um, at the Leo Beck Institute in New York already 12 years ago. And the discussions um, about the second generation interview project were also back then on the table, but um, I think we would have to change the whole design of the questionnaire, of um, the way how how the the, the 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 questions look like, because it's um, obviously like this this was a project for different generations of immigrants and and, and survivors. Um, so that's that's the first thing, and the second thing is um, we we talked very often about the end of this. Um, first uh, Austrian heritage um, collection project. And um, I mean, still until 2019, we were able to find interviews in the States. So um, it is reaching somehow an end, but we are not there at the moment. And this is the reason why we still try to collect them as many interviews as we can, but I don't know, like um, Francisco was also here, was one of the last Gedenkdieners at the Leo Beck Institute. Maybe she wants to add something to it, or maybe not. I don't know. Sorry for that, if not. <laughs> um, yes, hello. Maybe I'm very short. Um, we could manage to find a lot of people who would wanted to um, have some interviews with us. So we planned a trip to California for May. And we also wanted to interview Uth Kluger who died, who passed away like one month ago. So I think we still can find a lot of people, but um, time is running. So I think it gets harder and harder, yeah. And we, we already had to make some adjustments um, on the questionnaires. So we still, we still not answer, like we still didn't answer some questions. So because the people um, emigrated when they were 10 to 15 years, for example. So, yeah. Okay. Um... There was another question of Rachel. How did the project select interviewees? Only people who escaped Austria before the war? Were there interviews with DPs in Austria after the war? Um, no, if the, you know, the, the people who were approached were those who applied for this payment at the National Fund. So this was the first uh, contact. Uh, with uh, with those, so this was not the DP group, you know, 
the, those who came from other countries to Austria. I mean, this was a very big group. So they were not included in, as far as I know, um, in that group, which doesn't mean, well, if Philip and, and Francisca here, maybe they have different experiences uh, because, you know, if somebody would approach me and say, okay, I was in, let's say Salzburg, also would do the interview for, with this person. But this, I don't know if, if DPs are included. I don't think so. You know more, Philip? <laughs> No. Okay. okay. Which is a pity, because, but we had different DPs, DP projects as well. And then Philip mentioned it. So there are various projects. At, at the beginning, I tried to show that this is one of various projects. So um, the, the exhibitions on DPs and so on. And there's a very active group here, uh, that, which, you know, approaches DPs. So there is another question from Sarah. Um, she would like to know um, anything if there is anything about research projects that have been conducted based on the collections, if it's open to everyone, and if there is any attempt to encourage research with the sources in this collection. Yes, it's open. Please use it. <laughs> <laughs> I think we discussed it two years ago at the conference that we had um, about the 80 years after the Anschluss. But actually, you know, usually if you make interviews, you have a certain idea for a certain um, research project. And here the idea was really to collect as many interviews and memoirs as possible. And uh, I think also the, I mean, the website that um, Philip and others build in, in Austria, really the attempt is to make this accessible from different perspectives, right? To as many people as possible with different interests can work with these. But maybe yeah. um, Albert and Philip, you know more about other projects that came out already out of this. I mean, the the, the archive works like an archive. So you approach it because you have a special interest. Usually, yeah, you're interested in persons so and so, and then you can find information about the person. And this is how it really works out. And I've, whenever I read, you know, articles about. But somebody who was covered at the Lierbeck Institute, uh, there's always a reference to it. And I think this is one very, very positive sidestep um, of the project. Uh, so, I mean, this is what, what I try to do is really to, 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 to find a synopsis of the whole project. And this is very, very challenging. I mean, we have a different project with 800 interviews with survivors of the concentration camp in Mauthausen. And we have a, a very big group of, of researchers and it takes a while. It's, it's very, very intense and very, you know, it takes a lot of work to, to analyze this. So I think what, what I think the, the posit most positive thing is really that researchers are aware of the collection and use it in the way they need it to use it. And this is what archives are about, more or less. So it's not about, but there are also articles on the on the Austrian Heritage Collection. And, and um, there's a colleague and she finished, uh, I think it was a master thesis recently on, on the collection. But most of the ways, as far as I see it, it's used like an archive. And the, the, the positive thing is that it's so much is online nowadays. So we can use it worldwide. <laughs> I would like to ask something as well. Go ahead. Yes. And maybe it's for all three of you, Francesca and uh, Philip and Albert, of course, that first of all, um, the question of language, because I saw that the questionnaire was in, in English, uh, but in the interview itself, I saw that it, it's a combination between English and German. So how did it work? And how, why the questionnaire was in English and not in German? Um, and uh, second, how was the connection between young Gedenk Dienst volunteers, to, I assume non-Jewish volunteers, to the Jewish uh, Holocaust survivors? So did it affect, uh, what was the, the effect of this, uh, of this meeting of, um, and of, of this conversation between, between the languages, between the German, the, Germ the, the Austrian past and the, and the uh, American present? in, in uh, different uh, 
in different ages. Okay, the language question, I can respond from my, my perspective. So remember that we started out in the early 1990s. So we had a lot of survivors who, okay, were born 1905 until 1920 or so. And, um, but I found out that many of, of this generation really love to speak German, especially Austrian. So it's, which is a different German than German German. So they loved, they loved the kind of dialect. Um, and usually it was their choice, you know, in which language they would love to speak. But I would say for me, it was just fascinating to cover this German, you know, it was the German of the 1920s and 1930s. And I don't know if you ever worked with somebody, let's say from the Bukowina. Uh, this is a wonderful German. So it's, you know, it's not only the Viennese German, but nevertheless, I mean, it was a decision of the person who was interviewed in which language a person would, pref would prefer to, to get interviewed. And for me, it was interesting that the decisions often were made within the interviews. That's why I mentioned it with, the, with this army effect in the interview. But the questionnaire was in English. So the people are approached in English. And later on, it became, I think, more and more English. That's for sure, because well, to give you an example, I just interviewed uh, via Zoom, because it's not possible to go to New York or to Boston, somebody who was born 1930, and I mean, his, his language is the language, the German of an eight-year-old, so, and he won, you know, he is very well known, and I wouldn't like to, you know, to bring him into the situation to respond in a German of eight-year-old, so that's for sure that we speak English. And the relations, maybe Philip should talk about it as I think it's better because of Francisco, because you, you have first-hand experience. Maybe also Aria, you would like to add something. Aria is also with us who makes the interview oh. in Jerusalem. Okay. Yeah, so I, I can definitely add add something to that. As well, I, I experienced one uh, older man that I actually wanted to interview and he he agreed to the interview. And um, I went there and I realized that he was living on the third floor and he couldn't get out anymore. And there was no elevator. And um, when I came there, I... I actually couldn't uh, or wanted to start the interview and do it, but he actually didn't feel comfortable with the interview. And then I actually realized that he mainly wanted this human contact and he wanted somebody you know, to talk to and that's what we then did. But um, I do think that especially this, this, this aspect of the project is especially important and um yeah that experience also showed me that in a yeah, very uh, memorable way um yeah and he also asked me expi expli explicitly after that we that he would like to stay in contact you know um yeah, I think what is also important, um, besides the documentation of the life stories, one of the aims of the project was to re-establish contact between a younger generation of um, Austrians and this um, former Austrian Jewish generation. And um, Albert told us already, I mean, they were approached by letters and questionnaires and they responded to these letters and questionnaires. And um, very often when they, when we called them, like besides the snowball effect, of course, many of them, uh, very, very often when we, when we called them, they already knew a lot about the Liu Beck Institute, the project, and had, at least in my experience, um, it, it was very positive connotated. So in, in that sense, um, Actually, I felt always very welcome. And um, I think one way how we connected was 
because most of these um, persons lived in Vienna or were from, were from Vienna, was the city itself, like the district they came from, certain kind of areas that that, that, that was always um, a very important issue to, to connect with them. Um, Vienna and, 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 and talking about Vienna. Um, so like breaking the ice was in most cases when they had already contact to the Leo Beck Institute for me, easy. Um, the snowball effect thing was not easy. When somebody recommended another person who um, was also from Austria, who emigrated also from Austria to the States and I tried to approach um, persons who didn't know anything of the project just by phone number or something like this, that was quite complicated two or three times, but also not too hard because they somehow were informed by, I don't know, relatives or, or other interviews. Um, concerning the language, like my experience was that um, most of the older generations, so I interviewed I think my oldest uh, interview was 104 years old. So I interviewed people who were born like 1918, 1919, in the 1920s, like most of them talked German with me. And um, English was used as uh, I would say very often by the children of, of immigrants, like people who were born in the 30s for similar reasons as, as um, Albert pointed uh, out, but yeah, I mean, I think what, what became clear through the webpage and also um, the exhibition catalog, I mean, we managed, or some of the Gedenkdieners somehow managed to establish contacts um, with uh, Austrian immigrants and Holocaust survivors that last until now, until today. So I think that was also quite, um, uh, fruitful uh, outcome of, of the whole project. But I would like to add something. Uh, I think we always were tested. Yeah, if you come from Austria, it, it was always a, you know, people have to make sure that you're on the on the right side, more or less. So I just had the experience with this Zoom interview, and I was tested. Where was your father during the war, and so on. So uh, I think it was easier for the younger generation because they were the third generation. But um, it always, as, as, as Philip said, it was important to establish a, you know, a relationship uh, in which the other side could trust us more or less. So, and this was not so easy sometimes because, and I think I would like to, to use, uh, to take one uh, question which I read by Julian. Um, if we ever run into a wall during an interview, because this is something, you know, um, which sometimes happens. And I'm just writing an article about, you know, oral history and the different ways we, we talk with people about their life stories and, and therapy, because we, we, we use a lot of, you know, experience of therapists, how they handle difficult situations, for instance. And I just want to, to, to give some examples. And for instance, I just asked one of my colleagues uh, and she did interviews for the Mauthausen project and she said, and this is one of the responses. She said uh, she wanted to make an interview with with somebody. No, it was for this. Sorry, it was for the Shoah Foundation, uh, and it was recommended by the family. And she went to the person who should have been interviewed, and the person really didn't get didn't feel well with this, and she stopped the interviews because she said, uh, "I only do interviews when the person also." is ready to, to give an interview. And personally, um, you know, sometimes you have, you don't get between a certain kind of information. Uh, and um, I had some contacts when people said, I don't want to talk to you anymore because I found out a kind of family secret or a personal secret. And this was not too good <laughs> for the person. And we had, we had to discuss it. So we interrupted the interviews. And, uh, and in all three cases I'm thinking of now, we found a way to, to have an interview later on. But that, there was a moment where we really had to stop. 
And I think you have to accept it. I mean, you know, sometimes there are moments when you don't want to talk anymore, give more details about your life because it's too much. Uh, yeah. But I have to say some, there were some moments where I myself also wanted to stop an interview because it was too much for me. You know, if you really get details about camp experiences and torture, for, <laughs> yeah, it didn't happen too often, but it happened. But I didn't, I didn't stop the interview. But it, it's an important question. As this wall question, I'm sure you know the work of Dan Baron, who spoke of a double wall of silence, which I always found interesting. And, you know, I uh, was often thinking about the role we had because I also had experienced by the question about the second generation when we were the first who asked the person about his or her life and the second generation was in the background because they were never able to, to, to raise questions. I mean, I'm sure they had different questions, but we did the interview and it was a first step. Um, yeah, thank you. There's one more question remaining here in the chat um, about uh, those survivors that ended up in China. Um, I don't know about any future project that would include them. Um, have you heard about anything? Sure. Yeah. I was in Shanghai. Whenever you go there, there's a, a great museum, a Hongqiu. There was this ghetto. And that right now, well, there's an exhibition. There should be an exhibition because of the lockdown, it's closed at the Jewish Museum in Vienna. And <laughs> well, by the way, the first Gedenkdiener um, he, he was a student of Chinese studies and they had an, a wonderful conference here in Salzburg uh, where they invited survivors who, who escaped to Shanghai. And it, was, it was great. And I had this, I would say, sometimes I need some funny things in my life because, you know, sometimes it's too tough. And I heard that the Shanghai uh, emigres they were, you know, they love to play football or soccer, however you want to call it, in Europe. And what they did in Shanghai, they, they started a Jewish soccer league. And I asked people if there are survivors here who played for the Jewish soccer league. And I worked about sports in Shanghai. And there are lots of interviews about Shanghai. And uh, yeah. I wrote an article about sports in Shanghai for the museum now, oh, but I don't have the catalog now. But if somebody's interested, I don't know, she or he, everybody can approach me if there's an interest. But it's a wonderful story because it's a, it's a crazy story because I think this is something about, you know, when we do our interviews, we always have to, to ask how, how do you get strength in a situation like this? And it's this, you know, like uh, word resilience, which everybody uses. But I think to encourage young people to do something, yeah, when you cannot do anything because you don't have work, you you starve almost, and but you you have a body <laughs> and you can do, you know, and you can go to the, the soccer field and shout and <laughs> have fun. Uh, I think that's that's interesting. And it's it's a it's a positive example how you can survive a situation which is difficult over many years. So it's one of my favorite topics. <laughs> in, the, in the oral history division, there are, uh, I think, 15 interviews with the uh, um, Chinese uh, Jewish community. Mm -hmm. So you can take and, a look also there. And I mentioned at the beginning that one of my colleagues uh, to, for the design of the project was Sam Beck. And he was born, I think, 1945. Or? Uh, he was born in Shanghai of a Viennese family. So this also was part of the, you know, thinking about the project that we include all the various stories. Thank you very much. That was uh, very rich as always to hear you speaking about this project, which accompanies you already so many years. And um, it's 
there anything else that someone would like to say? Otherwise, I, I'd close the meeting. No, I would like to say I'm very sorry that I cannot see you. I only see a few people. And this is really something strange true for you as well. And I hope it worked out um, for you as well. But usually I would prefer a direct dialogue. Sure. I'm I an historian. <laughs> I hope we do the okay, best. I wish you all the best. Thank you.